of Safe Kids Bismarck, Hip Court. So yeah, we're um, happy to have Alyssa Presler. She is with Sanford Health in Bismarck um, and also with Safe Kids. So um, through Sanford. So I'll let her explain that more. But uh, thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Carly. Um, like she said, my name is Alyssa Presler. Um, I am the injury prevention coordinator for Sanford here in Bismarck. Um, I also run our Safe Kids Bismarck Mandan program out of our trauma department. Uh, so I do a lot of injury prevention, a lot of community engagement work. Um, and most recently, I've been very passionate about uh, firearm safety specifically. We've been seeing a lot of pediatric and childhood firearm injuries here. Um, and it's just really, really tragic to see. Um, and so I've been trying to get the word about out about safety and prevention, and we'll talk more about that today. So thanks for coming. Um, so briefly to start, um, I just want to throw out there, what is Safe Kids? Um, many of you have probably heard of it um, in the context of Safe Kids Grand Forks. Um, if you're around uh, Carly at all, uh, I know she works very closely with Karma and Safe Kids Grand Forks, and that uh, coalition has been around for a long, long time doing great work up in that corner of the state. Um, but for those of you that don't know, Safe Kids is a worldwide program um, that aims to reduce childhood um, serious injury and death um, through education, safety device distribution, car seat checks, and things like that. Um, since they were founded in 1988, they have uh, cut childhood um, deaths related to injury um, by over half. In, you know, in conjunction with other safety things, um, but childhood deaths are falling in relation to injury and we hope to keep them that way. Um, these are an overview of our Safe Kids coalitions in North Dakota. Um, there were four of them up until recently. Our Safe Kids Minot Coalition, um, Trinity Health in Minot has chosen not to renew their contract. Um, so we are quickly attempting to search for another person to pick up our Safe Kids Minot Coalition. Um, in the event that that doesn't happen, my coalition will probably end up taking um, some of on some of the responsibilities that Minot had um, as far as these territories go. But um, wherever you are in the state, uh, there is a Safe Kids that can get to you and can get you whatever uh, injury prevention materials and information you need. So just reach out to your local one. So introduction here, um, when we're talking about firearms uh, and firearm safety, uh, firearm injuries have surpassed our motor, motor vehicle crashes as a leading cause for injury-related death for kids in the U.S. So I'm going to repeat that, that it, it is the number one injury-related death for children in the U.S., firearms is. Um, our safest way to store a firearm is always outside of the home. They can't hurt themselves if there's not one there. Um, but this being North Dakota, this being a very rural hunt forward, hunting forward state, um, that's often unreasonable to ask. And I don't ask that of anybody. Um, I wanna be very clear, this is not about gun control. This is not about taking guns away. This is about uh, responsibility and safety when choosing to own those guns, which you are absolutely legally allowed to do. Um, the topic of firearms can often be considered taboo, so it's hard to kind of wade into those waters and to get into those conversations. Um, but I think they're really important conversations to have. And a good question is how can we keep these centered on safety? How can we protect our kids and keep them safe without um, offending anybody or uh, getting too far into the weeds as far as politics goes? So these are some statistics. I'm a big statistics girl. Um, so this, these are firearm-related injuries for children in North Dakota um, for the last six years, um, it, the most recent data we have. And you can look at these bar graphs and you say, oh, that's, that's really not that many when you compare it to other things that are you know, harming or killing children. But our firearms, the reason that we have problems with them is that they are so deadly. When I go out and teach kids in the community, it's always, you know, it's not, when you fall on your bike, you injure yourself, you can break your arm, you can scrape your knee. When you have an accident with a gun, it can be deadly, or it can at least be incredibly um, traumatic. 
So these are our fatalities, again, from the last six years. I want to point out that almost 70% of these fatalities were, were by suicide, and only 18% were due to accidental discharge. So that means 82% of those fatalities were intentional, whether suicide or homicide. 15% uh, of the firearms used were locked, um, which I think is another reason to uh, showcase safety as far as far firearms goes. So what does all this data mean? Um, I, I truly don't, I don't have a good solution, um, but I think looking at that, we can really confidently infer that parents can't always tell when children are depressed or suicidal. Um, and I think trying to convey that to the parents themselves is a difficult thing. Um, and I think we need to come up with better ways to tell parents in a way that they will listen. Um, we had our, um, uh, sorry, I'm not trying to um, We had an injury prevention workshop the Safe Kids Coalition did back in March, and I gave a very similar talk to this. Um, and prior to my talk, we heard from the child death reviewer in the state, uh, Jen Graybar. And she mentioned that one of the firearm deaths, this child was talking about depression, was talking about suicide. His parents knew that he was struggling with these problems. And when he finally committed suicide, he used a gun that was unlocked from his own room. Like he was storing a gun in his bedroom. And so, you know, parents just don't think it's going to happen. So how, how do we broach that topic? How do we talk to them in a way that they'll listen and just come at them without any political charge, just trying to keep our kids safe. So the role firearms can play in suicide success, uh, more than one third of child gun deaths are suicide. Um, that is That accounts for more than 700 each year nationwide. 90% of suicide attempts uh, with a gun result in death. This is generally much higher for attempts that use most, most other means. Um, for example, it is an 8% success rate when you look at drug poisoning. Um, and I want to share a story. So in my uh, previous career, I was an ER nurse. And one time when I was uh, working out in a small town in Idaho, uh, it was the middle of the night and a mom brought her teenage son in. Um, and he was suicidal. And part of the questions when they come in that way is, you know, what is your method? What do you how are you going to hurt yourself? And he said, I want to shoot myself. And so I looked at him and I looked at his mom and I said, okay, well, do you have access to a gun? And the mom said, no, I, I took the gun out of our house two weeks ago. And he kind of looks at me, he's like, okay, well, I guess I would just take a bunch of pills. And looking at these statistics, that mom removing the firearm from her home increased his chance of survival by 82%. Like that's just a huge increase in rate of survival for someone who's struggling with depression and suicidal ideation. Um, so keeping those firearms locked, keeping them out of your homes just in case is not a terrible idea. It can, it can truly save a life. Um, according to RAND, 55% of adults in North Dakota have a gun in their home. I would venture to say that it's much higher than that. Um, and children are four times more likely to die by suicide when there's a firearm in the home. So why safe storage? Um, I hope I hope I'm bringing this point home. Uh, safe storage can prevent deaths. Keeping that gun away from kids who may be too impulsive to make the decision and might use it inappropriately can prevent deaths. Children are three times more likely to die um, due to firearm-related homicides when there's a gun in the home. And then while well, data shows that other mechanisms of injury are more prevalent, firearms are definitely the most lethal. Um, if a kid can't access their firearm, their mechanism of injury becomes significantly less lethal. Uh, 34 children have died in the last six years in North Dakota, 34 of them. And I would venture to say that 98 if not a full 100% of them could have not died had there been safe storage practices in the book. So again, why safe storage? Teens can be impulsive, even if they know how to handle firearms safely and do so regularly. Keeping that firearm locked when not in use can save their life. Um, you know, we talk about teens that like to hunt those boys 
probably do have access to those hunting weapons. But just think about changing that lock. You know, they can they can ask when they want to go hunting. They don't need access to a firearm every minute of the day. Symptoms such as moodiness and withdrawal can be attributed to typical teenager behavior um, when in fact they're actually signs of depression and mental health issues. Um, so again, just how do you know? A parent thinks that they might know and most of them maybe do and most of them maybe are right, but 34 of them were wrong in the last six years. So just because we're on the ND bin webinar Wednesdays, um, I am trying to relate our topic to brain injury. Um, so research suggest, suggests that individuals with a TBI history will be at increased risk for suicidal thoughts and behaviors. And history of a moderate, moderate to severe TBI is associated with increased risk for suicide by firearms specifically. Um, so we talked about suicide success rate and what that um, and means for suicide attempts matter. Um, this makes firearm safety and safe storage even more important, especially if you have someone with uh, histories of TDIs in the home. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about concussion as it relates to suicidality. Um, my husband's a big concussion guy, um, and so I got a couple of good articles from him. Um, but a couple of quotes I have here are high levels of emotional distress in youth with persistent post-concussive symptoms it was not uncommon, which is a lot of mumbo jumbo, meaning people who have persistent post-concussive syndrome uh, who are really struggling with those, um, with those symptoms after a concussion are very, very likely to also be suicidal. Um, again, please keep those guns locked up. <laughs> Especially, you just never know. Um, and then the, this systematic review here, this uh, second one I posted, um, more than 700,000 patients diagnosed with concussion, um, which is also um, referred to as a mild TBI, um, compared with more than 6.2 million individuals um, were at a twofold higher risk for suicide. Uh, so experiencing concussion was associated with higher risk of suicide attempt and suicidal ideation. So living with people with TBIs, even with just basic concussions, especially if they're struggling with um, concussion symptoms that are persistent, um, are gonna be at, more at risk for suicidality. And then having a gun in that home is going to even more increase their risk for um, those suicidal thoughts to become successful if they choose to act well. So uh, I have some different ways to secure firearms. You'll see pictures here. Um, so the top left is called a cable lock. Uh, it th it's a wire that threads through the barrel of the gun. Um, that gun needs to be completely unloaded uh, and obviously unlocked uh, when you thread the cable lock through. I've heard not good reviews about these. Not being a handgun owner myself, I'm not super familiar with them um, as far as the workings, but I've not heard very good reviews from people who have tried to use these. Um, they're either flimsy or generally people who own handguns want to do so for protection and they are too clunky to unlock, load, and use for protection in the case that someone might need it. Um, so I don't, uh, these are available pretty widely um, for free or for low cost. Um, people generally don't take them and are not fans of them. Uh, that being said, if it works for you and that's something that you want in your home or that's something your people you work with want in your in their homes, absolutely. It is a great, great tool, great way to great thing to use. Um, most gunners, gun owners seem to prefer other ways to secure their firearms. Uh, the second one, the middle one here, is a biometric safe, and this is also for handguns. Um, if you can see in the picture, it holds one or two, depending on what size you get, and it is opened either with a combination lock or with like a thumbprint. So this is much quicker. You can leave, you know, if you're using your handgun for protection, if that's what your main interest is for the weapon, um, it can sit in there and then it is very quick to ask access, say in the middle of the night or in an emergency, um, much quicker to access. These, however, are generally um, more expensive. Um, so a little bit harder to distribute to the general public. Um, and then lastly, on the bottom, you see the large safe. Those would be for like your hunting weapons. Um, really the only 
the only thing that could hold uh, rifles and shotguns and such like that. Um, again, the uh, the safest way to store your firearms is with the ammunition separately. So the ammunition, the gun should be unloaded, locked, and separate from the ammunition. That is ideally the safest way to store it. So um, I mentioned in the first, uh, or talking about those locks, people generally do like handguns for self-defense. Um, the need for self-defense isn't necessarily backed up um, by research. So I found several articles online. This is this one gave me the best quote, um, but this one says there's no good evidence that a gun in the home provides a deterrent effect or reduces the likelihood of injury during an altercation or break-in. Uh, basically meaning that whatever weapon you have in the home, a gun isn't going to increase or uh, decrease your likelihood of an injury if someone were to break into your home. I also tried to look up um, break-in statistics in North Dakota. Uh, it was a little bit difficult to find, but they seem like they're pretty low compared to the rest of the uh, country. Um, regardless, you know, people want, want to feel secure in their homes and if a gun is the way to do it, I'm not saying that's the wrong way. I'm just begging people to uh, keep those locked up and keep them stored safely. Um, I also want to point out that this uh, particular article that I was reading, um, said gave overwhelming evidence that having a gun in the home increased the risk for homicide and increased the risk for um, intimate partner violence as well. Uh, I'm going to talk next about the responsibility of the caregiver. Uh, increasingly, parents in the U.S. are being held accountable for the injuries inflicted on or by children with a gun that belongs to the parent. Um, and I've got a couple snapshots of headlines here. Um, these have since evolved a lot of these cases, um, and some of you might recognize them from national headlines, but um, this mom of Virginia, um, six-year-old who shot their teacher, she was sentenced to 21 months. Um, I believe that was for having possession or being under the influence of marijuana while owning a gun, um, so that's a little bit different. Um, but most notably are is this one in Michigan, um, where the school shooter's parents um, both got convicted, actually, he went to jail um, because he had a firearm that was gifted to him inappropriately. Um, it was not secured properly, and then he used it to kill four other, uh, four of his classmates in high school. Um, I just want to point out that this is becoming more of a legal issue, um, and it speaks to the responsibility of owning weapons. It's not, Again, it's not an issue about, am I able to own them? It's what am I going to do when I do own them? It is a responsibility um, to lock those up and to keep our kids and children of other people safe. Um, so some programs that can be implemented in our communities, um, just advocate for it and educate on safe storage. I think it's not talked about enough. Um, you know, we, we talk about gun rights all the time. I, I frankly don't care. Um, you know, it's, I, I I'm happy to, that you want to keep your guns, that's fine, but please let's advocate for and educate on safe storage. Um, if you are in the position to be educating, I really encourage you to tailor education se sessions to different audiences. Um, you know, I've said before, your population in Bowman, North Dakota is going to be a lot different than your pop population in Florida, um, just on what their beliefs are, what their um, what their principles are and what they uh, hold to be important when it comes to firearm storage and ownership. Um, so tailoring those education sessions is gonna be really important. I think including patient stories is also really important if you have some that are in your patient's permission to use those. Um, and then I think learning to recognize and ask about our youth about mental health issues. And I know that this is a big push everywhere. Um, but I think reiterating it never hurts um, because mental health issues are clearly driving um, this problem. It's just that locking up our guns can at least reduce some of the harm. Hunter safety classes. So these are offered in North Dakota. I, I uh, encourage anyone who's got youth in their home to consider taking one of these. Um, 
these are really fabulous classes. Um, they can reduce accidental injuries by showing kids how to properly handle a firearm. Um, it is required for anyone who's going to hunt in the state um, who was born after 1961. Um, and the traditional course is 14 hours in classroom course. There is a home study option, which is split between classroom and online. And then there's this hunterend.com, which is an online course approved by the North Dakota Game and Fish. Um, and all of these links can be found on the North Dakota Game and Fish website, um, as far as registering for classes or finding out more information about um, laws and things when it, in this, when it comes to hunting. So prevention in our healthcare settings, um, I always encourage um, being from the emergency department background, I always encourage our clinics, emergency departments, inpatient units, um, make sure that you're doing those screenings. You know, if you are in healthcare, um, please make sure that you are doing those screenings that are assigned um, or that are appropriate for the patients that are in front of you. Um, and then once you have those screenings, if they're positive, what are you doing to follow it up? You know, so are we screening for suicide risk? If it's positive, are we asking about their plan? Are we asking if they have access to a lethal means? Um, do we know what our resources are? You know, as parents, if you have a suicidal child, do you know the best way to secure a gun? Or do you know where to take it if you want to get it out of your house? Um, these are all really good questions to ask and answers that we as um, public health units and um, healthcare workers should have the answers to. Um, if you are a parent and wanting to know where you can take your gun, if you want it out of the home, um, always good to start with law enforcement. Local law enforcement is always the best place to start. Um, I know Morton County will has a storage um, locker that they will lock up firearms with. I imagine most um, sheriff's departments will also do that. Um, um, we have some more resources available. So cable locks, like the first ones that I showed you, um, these are available for free at several North Dakota law enforcement offices. Uh, just to name a few, there's Bismarck, Burley, uh, sorry, Bismarck, Burley County, Wells County, Grand Forks County, Stutzman County, Kidder County, McLean County, and Barnes County. Um, is, and that's just maybe half the list of the uh, law enforcement offices in North Dakota that have them. Uh, Safe Kids Grand Forks and Safe Kids Fargo Moorhead also carry them for free or low cost um, if you are interested in those. We also have a Be Smart office in Fargo. So, for those of you that have not heard of the Be Smart um, initiative, it is a um, firearm safety initiative, and our office in North Dakota is located in Fargo. They have a wealth of information as well as um, these cable locks available. And then lastly, um, some biometric safe distribution. This is something that was mentioned and I will talk about it later. I have not heard if this is coming to fruition or not. Um, so I will get into that in just a couple of seconds. Some more resources available. So there are, um, if wherever you are in North Dakota, um, I encourage you to follow your local Safe Kids page if you don't already, um, because we do put out um, really informational Facebook posts. Um, and if you are interested in flyers or handouts, we also have those available. Please just reach out via Facebook or email. Um, we can get those to you. Um, Be Smart, like I said earlier, uh, besmartforkids.org has a ton of awesome resources, um, videos, testimonies, um, handouts, um, even like different curricula um, that are available to the public. Martha Wheeler is the name of the Fargo office coordinator. I really encourage you to reach out to her if you have any more um, questions or needs. And then Project Child Safe is another great resource. Um, that is the um, uh, project that supplies the gun safety kits to the law enforcement. So the uh, law enforcement units in North Dakota that have those locks um, are provided by Project Child Safe. Um, okay, so this is the slide I was talking about earlier. Um, in November or December, I think it was December, um, we had a statewide firearm safety meeting. Um, and this was called together by our state injury prevention coordinator and our state child death reviewer. Um, and they really wanted to let us know that firearm injuries are on the rise. 
for children at a decreasing age. So our suicide, you know, our, our ages for suicide were going from 16 to 18. They're decreasing now to 12, 13, 14 year olds, uh, which is just so, so young um, and just so tragic. And they really wanted to highlight the need for action to protect these children from firearms, um, especially through the promotion and education for safe storage. Um, and so uh, the state of North Dakota applied for federal funding to obtain biometric safes uh, for distribution in the state. I, they were hopeful that it was going to come through. I have not heard anything since, since, since December, um, since this meeting. You know, if it does come through, all of the Safe Kids Coalitions in North Dakota have volunteered to be distributors. Um, so if that comes through, we're, we would definitely put it out in some sort of press release or something um, to let people know that it's available. So hopefully it is still coming, um, but I haven't heard anything. I also want to point out that of note, the White House um, did promote uh, safe gun storage and announced their new executive uh, action to promote state gun storage. Um, it was, I think it's just a communication kind of template through the Department of Education, um, but just pointing out that it's it's becoming a, a real problem and even the federal legislator ha legislature has um, recognized the need for safe storage. Uh, just wanna talk about some other avenues for violence prevention. Um, we have some fabulous community engagement officers. Uh, for those of you that are in Bismarck, you probably know Officer Fuller and Officer Horn. Um, they are two of my favorite people. I work with them probably weekly on different projects. Um, we also have some fabulous student resource officers. These guys are out in the community every day um, working with our youth, um, you know, working on violence prevention and community engagement um, and just really promoting that close relationship between law enforcement and the children. Um, I also do some stop the bleed training. Um, this NDSU extension has a grant uh, that is doing stop the bleed training. And for those of you that don't know what that is, um, that's a lot more of a reactive thing um, for anyone who's injured in a way that is bleeding profusely. Um, this teaches um, the learner to stop life-threatening bleeding. Um, and these classes are offered by NDSU extension um, primarily in some of the smaller towns, they got a grant to go through most of the small towns um, and give out these classes. I do this class here for all of our um, medical career students that are in the public and in private high schools. Um, and I know Sanford Fargo Injury Prevention also teaches these classes. Um, Trinity Hospital was doing it up in Minot. Um, since they have not sign their safe kids contract. I'm not confident that they're still doing this training. Uh, hopefully they still are. Um, but that would be a good question for the Trinity for those of you that are in not. All right. And with all of that information, um, I'm going to any questions. Any questions for Alyssa? You can type in the chat. You can unmute and ask. I'll just say thank you for being so brave to talk about such a tough topic, but important. Thank you. Thank you. I always I feel like I need to give a million caveats because I really, really um, have nothing against the Second Amendment. And right. I'm right. Really sick of seeing kids, uh, kids being injured. Oh, Trinity is not doing stuff with you. Okay. Uh, is that I don't know what FBHE is. I'm sorry, Susan. Yeah. I'm a Grey's Anatomy person, and I just didn't they just do that on the last Grey's Anatomy? They like came up with that idea to teach Stop the Bleed, basically. It was a good one. Really? Yeah. First District Health Unit. Okay, sorry, Susan, thank you. Um, yeah, First District Health Unit uh, seems to be taking on a lot of the things that Amber in my note was doing. So thank you very much for that. Good, good. Yeah. Anyone else have any questions? That was a lot shorter than my allotted hour and a half, but I'm that's fine. No, it's okay. It's it's yeah. I think um, if you don't mind. I'm just gonna share what I've heard, anyways, from like a brain injury perspective, as well in terms of prevention. I've heard a lot of um, 
what was the VA that put the idea or that I heard speak on it? Um, and they talked a lot about putting space and time between action and thought. And I think that's really important with our population being so impulsive, right? Because that's mm -hmm. the the why we wanted Alyssa to come on here and talk about. So that uh, putting space and time between action and thought, obviously the storing the gun appropriately helps with that. But then even to, you can take it one step further. I've heard of campaigns. Um, there's one called Freeze the Key. So like with those cable locks, they have a key. And so they want you to freeze the key like in a container, a storage container or, you know, like a Rubbermaid and you put it in the bottom, fill it up with water, put it in the freezer. So then when you need your firearm, you have to wait for that ice to melt to get that key out. So it's putting space and time between action and thought. Some others I've heard is putting pictures of your family members or loved ones on gun safes like let's say you have like that big safe or that biometric mm -hmm. type one putting just pictures of you know reasons to not harm yourself on there can help as well and then I've heard as well with the key one um, to give someone that knows you really well that you trust and are comfortable with and knows your baseline your key and so then when you need your gun they can assess your your well-being and see if it's okay for you to access your firearm if that is something too I think that's important for those of you that you know might be a survivor yourself or might um, be a caregiver to a survivor um, a brain injury but yeah the safe storage obviously Absolutely. critical as well ideas. yeah yes. I like those ones yeah that that whole space and time between action and thought we just really want to slow down that that impulsive thinking and and um not jumping right to that final act so absolutely yeah oh fun <laughs> yeah Cassie said she's just gonna put in a plug for the VA yes I've heard some great um a great speaker there and that is where our cable locks come from the ones that we give out we get from the VA and then we can pass them out as well I I'm I'm glad to hear that feedback though because I I'm not a gun user myself and I don't yeah I'm, my family really isn't so I I've never heard that about the cable locks, but that's good to know. And that maybe explains right. why I've had a lot <laughs> for several yes. years. Um, yeah. Okay. So yes, I grew up in a hunting family, but those sure. are not usually pistols, right? Like right. those are, those require a big old safe. Yeah. Uh, or yep. stored at you know grandpa's house. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Exactly. So. Yes. Alyssa, I have a question. Are you um having to or experiencing like as far as the safety locks go? Um, demonstrating how to use them, you know, not just handing them out, but show like, are people familiar with how to use them when you're giving them? That's a great question. Um, I actually don't have any cable locks that I have given out. Um, I haven't had any takers on those. Uh, I think, a great question. That yeah, that's a, that is a good question. And um, I believe the ones we give out have a little like pamphlet inside them, but I honestly haven't really inspected them and I only think I've given out a few but no I would I don't know how to use it so no I was definitely not yeah I would I would probably use. need like a hunter safety course and right you put that on there um, yeah yeah and I, I, I um at outreach events like when they've been gave out a lot of people think that they're bike locks you know but I thinking back do I don't think I've yeah. I've uh like done one myself either so be that's, helpful. That's a really good question. It should probably get playing with those. I our um our safe kids Fargo Moorhead coordinator Katie um actually is in the process of taking hunter safety with her two step children uh, because she just wants to be better educated on uh, safe practices and things like that. So I imagine she would probably be able to put that for us. There you go. Good. Anyone else? Any other questions or anything for Alyssa? Great information. I mean, horrible information. When you said people think that's not big, I think that's way too big. Um, has conceal and carry made guns more accessible? Oh, well, that was a great question that I am not sure the answer to. I'm sorry, Lorelai. I know. I'm sorry, Lorelai. I don't either. I'm not sure that I know the answer. Yeah, I wish I would have brought uh, I should have brought my community engagement officer on. Yeah. Should have convinced her to pop on. Right. Yeah. Answered. Well, when you talked about um, hunter safety class too, I um, 
took and Shannon, our staff member in Fargo of ours, she took it as well. But um, so I, I would assume Bismarck and the other maybe other police departments, but for sure, Grand Forks and Fargo has what they call citizens academies. Um, very, very cool. Very highly recommend that they are taught by in Grand Forks. It's taught by those like resource officers like you showed in Bismarck. Um, and it's an evening course. It was three hours each night. And I think it, we met for like eight or nine weeks. It was fairly long, but amazing. And you learned the ins and outs of like the police department in your community, basically. You get to go on a ride along. You, uh, I don't know, you see, you learn a lot about like hindsight and just how officers have to think on their feet so fast. And uh, you can get tased if you want to be tased. I opted out of being tased, but um, but yeah, it's it's a pretty interesting course. I would highly recommend checking if your community offers it because Grand Forks and Fargo do, and it was great and it was free. Uh, yeah. So yeah. yeah, I think the reaching out to our community officers, they are in that position, like especially the community engagement officers. They love to interact with the community. They love to interact with people. Um, and they will answer those questions. I sat with um, our officer, Katie Horn, this morning for three and a half hours at a different event. And every question, she just loves answering any questions and being there for the community. Um, so any chance you guys can get to interact with your community engagement officers, I encourage you to do so. All right. Well, I think we're going to let you go, Alyssa, but we really appreciate your time and your expertise and insight on all this good topic so thank you so much yeah, thank you Carly thank you everyone for listening